<clears throat> this is one of our uh, productions of GCI. Uh, it's a series of uh, videos called You're Included. And uh, it is very strongly Trinitarian based because as you know that we have embraced a Trinitarian perspective of who God is. And of course, our, our connection and relationship with God uh, has a Trinitarian connection. We have Jesus Christ who reconciles us, the Holy Spirit who uh, uh, sheds abroad his love in us, reconciled to the Father. So obviously the uh, very powerful Trinitarian message in the scriptures. The hosts today, uh, or the host and the guests today are Michael Fizel, who actually is a minister of ours, but retired at the time at this time. And the uh, two guests who he will discuss and have the discussion with is, one is Baxter Kruger, who is a, a theologian uh, and uh, schooled in a very strong Trinitarian perspective. And of course, the other you might remember, William Paul Young, who wrote a book called The Shack. So uh, this is a conversation between the three of them. And the subject is evangelism. And they bring it from a Trinitarian perspective. And as we go through this, uh, you know, uh, through this uh, discussion, uh, keep those three questions that I had penned down for you in mind. One is, is the message more important than the method? You know, many times we are constantly trying to focus on the method of propagating the gospel. And we tend to sometimes forget what is the actual message we are preaching. And so perhaps, perhaps uh, that is something that uh, we may need to focus on. A second question is, is evangelism accomplished through our daily lives or reserved only for professionals? In other words, is evangelism something that is uh, necessary for every Christian or only for tra those trained in evangelism? Uh, should it be organic? You know, so these are thoughts that uh, come out in the discussion and you may have some thoughts to share with us. And the third question is, should we initiate friendship with an agenda to evangelize? I specifically put this question. Of course, the discussion also has it. Uh, but in our context, in the Indian context, you know, I think this question is more pertinent because in, in our country, Christians are accused of having an agenda all the time to try to convert people. And they accuse us of, of forced conversion. They accuse us of coerced conversion. They accuse us of manipulated conversion. So uh, everything we do is looked through the eyes of as though we are manipulating people. And so perhaps that's a, a question that we need to uh, face and answer and ensure that we are uh, we are ethical in the way we do things, in the way we preach the gospel. We are very careful uh, that we don't take away the freedom of conscience of people, that we don't scare people into, you know, becoming a Christian, uh, manipulate them in any way. Uh, so these are thoughts that I thought would be interesting for us to uh, have a talk with. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and roll the tape. Uh, it should be a little under 30 minutes, and then we'll uh, take a discussion. Praveen, go ahead. On this episode of You're Included, C. Baxter Kruger and Paul Young return to discuss the impact of the Trinity on evangelism and our participation in the message of Jesus. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for being with us on Your Included. Thank you. It's always fun to be here. Well, we enjoy Good it. Good to see you again, Mike. And uh, this time we want to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, we, we, uh, evangelism, of course, is the big word in uh, Western Christianity. Everything revolves around evangelism and what are you doing to share the gospel. And it's like the uh, 11th commandment uh, in the Old Testament and it's the it's the uh, fundraising arm of yes. the religious Christianity. But uh, I grew up in the Presbyterian we, Church. I didn't know what that word was until I went to seminary. So, but we need we do want to share the gospel, and uh, 
but how's that done? And how does Trinitarian theology affect evangelism? What, what are the implications? What, uh, what is the impact? How are we to see evangelism and think of it? And uh, let's talk about that. It's a great question. Hmm? Go ahead, Baxter. <laughs> well, the first thing that comes to my mind is that when you start off with the Father, Son, and Spirit, you have a relationship, and they, they love one another in complete and utter oneness. Their dream for us is to draw us into their relationship so that it can become as much ours as it is theirs. So the message of the gospel, the good news, is that you're included. And that's what we're supposed to share with people. And I think the best way to share it with them is the way the Father, Son, and Spirit share it with us, which is as persons in relationship. So in terms of having a program where we're trying to knock on doors or we're doing different things, to me it's about um, this city here is, what, 20 million people around here? who are included in the life of Jesus that probably have not much of a clue about that. The way we do that is, is by uh, one person at a time in relationship, getting to know people, inviting them over, talking with them. And I think underneath that, um, as a freeing aspect for a normal Christian person, is the more we grow in the knowledge and understanding and intimacy that, we, that we're loved, and that we're cared for, the more free and natural it is to share. you got more confidence because this is good. This has really helped my life. I want you to see this. How can I come alongside and share this with you? Sometimes informationally, sometimes it may just be befriending them. Um, Don't you think that a lot of times evangelism is a, is a segment of spirituality in terms of how it's presented? And the idea of evangelism is to get somebody from point A to point somewhere else. From outside to inside. Outside to inside. Across the line. Across the bridge. Mm -hmm. Whatever. And, uh, and that's not what you're talking about at all. Well, Jesus has crossed the line and crossed the bridge and found the human race. And that's what's true. And, and he's called us as Christians to go and share that with the world so that they can know they're included too. And then we can walk together and begin to figure out what this life means. How do we live this way? How do we participate in that Trinitarian life? But for me right now, at this point in history, I think the most important part of the discussion of evangelism is not the method, but the message. Mm. I mean, the message that I'm hearing is that there's a huge chasm between God and us, and that there's all these different ways that we can get across over to God. And once we get across that big chasm in Jesus, by faith, repentance, maybe by um uh, baptism or by sacraments or all these different things that we got to do. But once we cross that, then we're loved, then we're accepted, then we're reconciled, then we're saved, then we're sanctified, then all the adopted. And I'm saying the message to be proclaimed is that, that yes, there was a huge chasm that Adam and Eve in their disobedience plunged the human race into darkness. There was a huge chasm, but then there's this thing called the incarnation where the Father, Son came across the chasm to find us in the far country, put us on his shoulders, and bring us back to his Father. Now, that's when we were loved and saved and reconciled, but we're still in the dark and have no clue as to who we are and living out of our darkness, and it's fear, and it's insecurity, and it's pain, and it's meaninglessness. I mean, this is we belong to the Father, Son, and Spirit. I, I package it this way sometimes just to make to make the point very stark in contrast to what I have heard all my life on radio and television, all that. the gospel is not the news that we can receive Jesus into our lives. The gospel is the news that Jesus has received us into his life. He has made us part of his world, part of his relationship with the Father, the Holy Spirit, and his relationship with all creation. That's the good news. And so we're, we're, we've got to get the message worked out, and I think the Holy Spirit's doing that right now. The last... 30 years, it's been, it's like turning up the heat on this. It's beautiful. People are really beginning to wrestle with it. You're telling me that that guy sitting on the park bench is included? That's exactly what I'm telling you. He wouldn't have been able to come inside of God's creation apart from being included. Does he know that? Heck no, he doesn't know it. Because he doesn't know it, he's scared to death. He doesn't know where his next meal is going to come from. He, didn't, he doesn't know what to do with life. It's so precarious. He's, he's frozen in fear. Well, when we see that, we can go begin to share with him who he is because of who Jesus is. That may mean befriending him. It may mean giving him a place to live. It may mean helping him out. Or it may just mean you know, sharing one word with him in that particular moment. 
And I don't want to formulate the thing so that we've got this one package and we just so more, more or less go and puke on everybody whether they're, they're ready to hear it or not. It's much more relational. And you're saying also that there's no part of life that is not evangelism in that sense. I mean, we embody the good news because we are participating in, in the, the truth and the love and the grace that we already have come to know, even though we're not fully there yet and we're in the process ourselves. And, uh, and so love becomes at the, at the centerpiece of this, the way we love one another and the way that we love others, the way we love our enemies. The, the old sacred-secular dichotomy has got to be dismantled in this too because if, if you throw your lot in 100% with the Father, Son, and Spirit, and you surrender wholly to them, they're going to do a whole lot more for you than make you simply an evangelist. You're going to be a good human being. You're going to be a, you're going to be a bass fisher. Maybe you make lures. You're going to be into everything that they're into, and they're into everything in this cosmos. Yeah. So that sacred-secular dichotomy goes away so that the more we throw ourselves in with the Father, Son, and Spirit, the more like them their life begins to flow through us in an infinite variety of ways. And it may well be through through uh, joining a, a lure-making association that you meet three or four guys and you end up having a beer with them and talking and you meet, and they, their lives start, they've started un, un, sharing their lives with you right there. And you begin to to talk to them about what your experience has been and what's given you hope and why and why you enjoy things like fishing. And, and their lives may begin to be revolutionized simply by a discussion about fishing that's not rooted in the sacred-secular dichotomy and not rooted in the ogre god who's got us afraid and trying to make us religious androids. I mean, that... Yeah. And that's, well, isn't that... that that's, I've, I've seen these um, kits, you know, where they'll, you'll go through the videotape and the lessons and all about relational evangelism and it talks about how to go out and, 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 and make friends with people and all. And, and from the outset, the only reason you're making friends with these people and you've targeted them, is because, well, they need the gospel, so I'm going to befriend them so that I can keep working with them until the right point comes where I can present the gospel. And, and it, it's just, it, it, to me, that's an artificial, at least this is how it strikes me, it's, mm -hmm. it's an artificial friendship that you're making only because you think, well, I need to get the gospel to them, therefore I'll make friends with them, in order to get the opportunity so let's, to give them the Let's doctor. fake the relationship gonna, so I can it, maybe get you introduced to a real one. Exactly. How, how many of us have been involved with somebody inviting us over to their house and, and so that they can really exactly. you know, tell us what the agenda is? Oh, well, well, it's not it's fundraising just, this time. It's evangelism this time. Yeah. <laughs> it's the so, same so technique. You're a, you're a, yeah, you're a project. It's like you're, it's like you're a, uh, a used car salesman, not a used, uh, a, a, an insurance salesman. And you're always having to think, in order to, to survive and make, make enough money to get by, you've always got to think of everybody as a potential Target. sale. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you are always exactly have that in the back of your mind. And well, once you sell the car to them, that's the end of it. Yeah. And the goal of evangelism is discipleship and inclusion in the community. And isn't, yeah. if, if people matter, if they really are real and they matter, isn't it... And is it and, and and relation uh, having right relationships is the goal of life. Then, as you were saying, Paul, everything is is evangelism in that sense. Absolutely. So that our very definition of evangelism, the end is the relationship. It's okay to have friends for the sake of friendship. Of being friends it's okay for them. Because it's okay to be friendly and be friends because people matter. They're worth being friends with. Yeah, for their sake. Now, uh, I think Peter said, be ready always to give, a, give a, a, an answer for the hope that lies within you. And, and well, that's to assuming live, somebody asks you about exactly, the hope that lies within you. Live such a life so that people might even ask or be... How often does that happen? But do we have to <laughs> make every friendship for the sake of, as though, you know, this person's going to go to hell if we don't get... Uh, so we got to find a sneaky way to... Uh, you know, to get the gospel to we're, them. We're Can we trust God to to be who He is for them, and enjoy them as a person, without having this constant thing in the back of our mind? Oh, when how am I? When can I work in the gospel? How am I going to work in? Aren't we being Christ to them? That's exactly the point. In the friendship itself, I, I, well, well, that is the point. I mean, we we're train stops in people's lives. Now with family. To train stop more often than not, but we're free to love them and to be there for them. 
that Jesus is the is the evangelist, and the Holy Spirit is the is the redeeming genius. Uh, I, we're called into what they're doing. They're the ones that are burdened for the whole world to come to see the truth, not us. And they can they're using us to be part of that process in people's life. We get to be free to love a person for their sake. I don't need to have a fully worked out agenda for the man on the park bench. I'm free to care for him in this in this moment. If it goes somewhere else, then I'll follow and see where it goes. And but it's it's a good thing to care for someone. So okay, this man needs food. That's fantastic. Help him get food. And it may be that the Lord wants me to do something a little bit more with it. I don't know. But it, the gift itself is for him. It's for his blessing, his benefit. The Holy Spirit can interpret that. So as we live out of the other centeredness, that is outside of ourselves, which what do we do that? You know, maybe two or three seconds every day, but during those two or three seconds when we're living <laughs> in a non-self-centered way and Christ is, is living in us, isn't that the way we are? In other words, we're, it, it's natural to care about somebody and to help where you can and be present for someone in their need as, as we're able. I think we are by nature, because of our union with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now are by nature lovers of people. I think that's what is true about us. We just don't know it. And as a yeah. man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you think, I, and I, if you think you're not, then you're going to function like you're not. Yeah. But I also think that a lot of times our struggle with the methodologies of evangelism is because they're not natural to our nature. Of, of which is to love. Yeah. You know, how, how many classes did you take on, on being a father and loving your child, you know, and making sure that the methodology was right? And it's not that we don't get help along the way, but there is something that that child brings to us by virtue of who we are now. I am a father, and they are my child. And yeah, I do grow in that, but let me tell you, it's, there's not a methodology about it that then makes me vo more valuable to that son or daughter. And, um, and, and, and I love the idea that there is a, a, a God who has climbed into our inabilities and joined us in that with all of their ability to be present, to be kind. You know, you look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's a description of God. It's not commodities that God has that He dispenses when you ask for Him or need Him. This is God. You know, this is the fruit of the Spirit, and the Spirit is of the same nature and character as the Father and the Son. Kindness, gentleness. You know, when have those things been part of a methodology of evangelism? Right. I mean, everybody wants to be known, and everybody, and everybody wants to be cared for. And when you know and care for someone, you're going to have conversations with them. It's, I, when when Contrita hit Mississippi Gulf, Gulf Coast and just ripped our coast completely apart, we were all watching on TV in Jackson until our electricity went off. And I remember driving to the Coliseum. I don't know what I was doing, but I was driving by the Coliseum the the day, but it was the day before Katrina hit. This is this is a hundred and something, mile, 180 miles from our coast. There were 200 cherry pickers lined up in the parking lot uh, from all over the country. People had taken their vacation time. The companies donated a the truck. They were lined up the day of two days before Katrina hit, actually. And the minute the storm was over, those guys were making us going straight down 49 to our coast. And I was having a conversation during that same period about someone who was asking me what I thought about the emerging church. And it's the same thing to me when you say, what about evangelism? I want to know where does the origin for that kind of concern and that kind of camaraderie and brotherhood come from. That's not evil. That's not coming from the devil. There were some people that drove as far as Oregon, mm. and some probably from Canada. Now, our guys have done the same thing for them. It's part of a tradition to help each other in that particular, this one little world. Mm. So you want to talk about evangelism, you want to talk about, about emerging church. The first thing we need to do is we need to begin to identify that Jesus is already everywhere anyway and already at work. Because I want to talk to those men, and I want to say thank you as a, as a son of Mississippi. Thank you for taking your vacation. Thank your families for helping us out. And then I want to say to them, that's beautiful. That's sacrificial. That's other-centered. And I want to say, that sounds just like the Father, Son, and Spirit. 
and, and begin to have a comfort, approach those guys in that honor and dignity, that opens up an entirely new world as opposed to, okay, Paul, we got 200 guys. Yeah. They're not going to be in Mississippi again. Let's go blitzkrieg them. Let's leave mm-hmm. Baptist. Let's make sure that they pray a prayer so they can get out of Jesus. I mean, get out of where they are into Jesus. And so we'll at least know they're saved when they go home. I mean, who's the joke on there? Yeah. I mean, who's blind there? What is really happening? You know, to be able. And so we got all these discussions about the emerging church. But if that's not the emerging church, I don't want to be a part of one. And, and, and you end up treating people like targets. You, know, you lose the value of their humanity. Exactly. How, many, yeah. how many funeral services have you been to? And I've been to, uh, unfortunately, one really recently for a young man who is um, my youngest son's best friend who was killed in a dirt bike accident just a couple weeks ago and uh, who is a member of our family. And we, we grieve him deeply. But well-meaning brothers and sisters in our, commu- in our family conversation they want to use that time to evangelize people because they know that people's hearts are sensitive. And I'm thinking, I want, because their hearts are sensitive, I want to treat them with a greater degree of respect and kindness than they've ever known. And to, to turn this event into um, a marketing opportunity, into a commercial, I think is just so devastating and, and so short-sighted. You know, let's, let's enter into each other's pain and sorrow. And let me tell you, the young people, the generation that's coming up, that was in the middle of this loss, they showed up in a way that a lot of the adults didn't know how to because they knew about the value of being in the middle of it with each other. And that became the, why people would ask the question, how come this is different? What is this about the celebration of someone's life? What is this hope that is not just so bent by grief, right? And, and, and then it becomes a part of the expression of our lives together because we actually value those people because we know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is all over them to begin with and values them. And evangelism is no longer a methodology or a part of our spirituality or anything like that. It becomes an expression. And, and we get to treat people like we know they matter because of the way we've been treated because we found out we mattered. You know, tell, tell the story of, um, of the seminary student and the farmer. I think it has total application to the conversation at this point. The, this, is the, uh, this happened to me years ago. I was, I was going to speak somewhere in the Midwest. I just remember it was really, really flat. And the guy, this, this, uh, actually is a college student, or a seminary student, he picked me up at the airport and we get in the car and we're going to the university and it's just flat. There's farmers everywhere. So I say, what are you going to do when you, he, I said, are you a junior, senior? He said, I'm a senior. I said, what are you going to do when you graduate? He says, I'm going to go to seminary. So I said, well, are you going to be a missionary or a pastor? And he said, I, no, not a missionary. I'll probably be a pastor. And just about that time, this huge John Deere tractor made a turn right in the field, right by the road and went, th- you know, went back out. And I said, well, you see this man on the, the tractor. Uh, have you ever thought about how Jesus relates to him and his farming? He spends 60, 70 hours a week on a, on a tractor. His whole family network is all about farming. And he said, well, I never thought about that. And, and I will never forget to look at his face because he looked at me like I had that third eye growing. And I'm like, what, what, where'd you come from? What kind of question is that? And I said, well, this is an important question. More than likely, you're going to have a, a whole church full of farmers and their families who give their entire lives to farming. And he said, and I said, so it's an important question. How does Jesus relate to the farmer? And he said, well, I I just don't know. I've never thought about it. And I said, well, I said, when you get home tonight and you get ready to eat your supper, what do you do before you take your first bite? And he said, well, I thank the Lord for the food. And I said, well, why are you thanking the Lord for the food that the farmer grew? And he said, well, you're not saying I'm not supposed to thank the farmer. And I said, no, no, I'm saying, I mean, you're not saying I'm supposed to thank the Lord. I said, no, thank the Lord. What I'm trying to help you see is that your prayer already knows how Jesus relates to the farmer. You just don't have a theology that will allow you to see what your prayer already knows. And he says, well, I think I'm getting it. What are you talking about? I said, you're thanking the God for the farmer, thanking the God for the food that the farmer grew. So you're saying the farmer is participating in a provision that's coming from the Father, Son, and Spirit to you. You are recognizing in your prayer that that man is included and is a participant. Yet you don't have a theology that will allow you to approach him that way. 
Now, to take that story and extend it to this conversation, he's going to go knock on his door and pretend that he's outside and try to get him to jump through the hoops to get inside. And then once he gets him inside because of the sacred secular dichotomy, he's going to try to get him to be less of a farmer and more of a Christian who's doing these things over in the secular, sacred world. I mean, no wonder nobody wants to be in the middle of that. Yeah. But we don't even see who the farmer really is. And, and we can't treat him with the proper dignity or his family. And if we did... He probably knocked the door down to come to have more to learn more about this in Sunday morning because nobody else is telling me anything about that. Everybody else is treating me like I'm just a farmer. So that is, these are huge questions to me. But on that practical level, when we see who people really are and whose life they've been included in and what life is coming out of them or trying to, we begin to relate to them in that in that with light, the light of Jesus, and, and people want to know about that. Farmer wants to know. I talk to Marines. A chance to speak to Marines at, at one of the bases in the United States. Um, and, and we had a, a long discussion, and I said to them, I said, before we get into a big, long discussion about this, I want to say one thing to you. You are concerned to protect, and you have a passion in your soul to protect and to create space for freedom for life. And I said, that comes from the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, we can get into arguments as to whether, you know, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the burden that you bear in your soul, what motivates you to work and, and to protect and defend and to brave the seas and to go into situations. I mean, you're being moved by a, a love for freedom and life. And I want you to know that has its origin in the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so I'm sitting in the room with Marines telling this story, and they're all crying. Not all of them, most of them, big guys. Because they know I've spoken to what's motivating their being. And now I'm trying to help them to see who that is. You don't think they want to be in the conversation? That Sunday night, they bring their wives and their little boys to the church to have a conversation. And how different is that from me having a methodology of evangelism that's fundamentally for a lot of us that was motivated by guilt, fear that we're not going to be doing something that God required of us, guilt that we'd end up with somebody's blood on our hands because we didn't, and then we treat everybody like a target, not, be, not because they're human beings who matter, but because we're still trying to deal with our criteria of what it means to be successful spiritually. Mm -hmm. And it's motivated by all the wrong things. And you could even take that and make it, make it artificial too, if you just turn it into a, here's what you say. Yeah. It needs to be real in order for and, it to, and, and to, by, and by to be real. Because relationship is real. And by yeah. real, the point is, and this is where it forces us to be real, because what we're really doing in evangelism is we're saying, hey, come walk with us. Come walk with us. We believe Jesus is leading us into life. Come walk with us and do this with us. And we, we don't have it all worked out, but this is what we do see. And come walk with us. And if that's not what we're saying in the pulpit, preaching, teaching, evangelism, is come walk with us, then exactly what, what are we saying? Come jump through a hoop and get through something. But, but it's either we're trying to walk with Jesus and understand, and broken as we are and blind as we are, but what we're trying to do here is participate in that life. Come join us. Come walk with us. We see it in you. We want to help. We want to encourage you. And we're going to encourage you in broken ways. But just walk with us. That's what Jesus says. Come walk with me. Follow me. The disciples of John the Baptist come up behind him and say, you know, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he turns and says, oh, you want to know where I'm dwelling? That's the word used. I don't know why they translate it staying. It's Jesus like, you want to know where I'm staying? Where I dwell, you mean like in the bosom of my father? Walk with me, and, I'll, and you will see. And evangelism is nothing, in its truest sense, is nothing other than an invitation to come share life. This is it. Come share life with us. Walk together. And let's walk with, and that is so much different. They're so very different than approaching a person, okay, you are outside I have to manipulate you to get you to jump through the hoops that I was taught that are going to change in two years, but I don't know that right now, that you got to say it this way and jump through these hoops. And, and i got to figure out a way to get you to do that when you don't want to do that. And I don't even really want to do it because I, I know you. We play golf together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now i got to treat you like we're not friends and, and get you to, to do this. It's very artificial. But it comes down to are we inviting people to walk with us in our lives? And, you know, I totally understand the, the, the struggle that's involved in this conversation, period. As soon as you start to talk about evangelism, you almost always have to go to methodology. And as soon as you do that, it's no longer 
dynamic and organic and relational. It's no longer me in the midst of my world loving the people who are in it and allowing that love to generate whatever the conversations are. And again, for a lot of believers, they don't even know who they are here. Therefore, having a methodology becomes the in-between step to thinking that that defines what a believer is supposed to do, right? But until they know that they're loved, this is not going to be a dynamic and organic and a relational thing either. But, and so we've got this struggle. Uh, by, it's like saying, well, now our new method of evangelism is to love somebody. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, well, it, 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 Dietrich Bonhoeffer had this great quote where he said, Jesus himself did not uh, try to convert the two thieves on the cross. He waited until one of them turned to him. Mm. And he knew that the other one he was going to meet on the other side for I think in just a few minutes. Them all and just with both of them in just a few minutes. Well, I mean, he, they're both going to die. That's what, right. What's the other That's thief right. going to meet on the other side? I think See? it was a lesson for us. Yeah, I wanted to tell. I've got several st stories. I wish we had time to tell. Maybe another time. But one, I was in. Um, I think I was in Kona, and they had done the cl some of the people that I was teaching had done an evangelism class or something like that. Uh, and the guy that was teaching, I think, if I remember correct, was from, from California, maybe Southern California. But he had told them, here's what I want you to do, uh, or she had. Um, I want you to get together in groups of three, and I want you to pray and ask the Lord, what do you want us to do? Just pray. Lord, show us. And so if he doesn't say anything, just get back together and pray. There's no pressure. Do whatever. Anyway, this one story that I heard, they got together and prayed, and they said there's a they saw the, one of them saw a girl standing behind a counter with a blue shirt on. Another one said her name was, saw a tag, said Sarah, and, and that's about it. And then another one said something about uh, finances, that finances are going to be okay. And that's all they knew. And they didn't even know where she was or anything. So they just decided to go for a coffee down in the town. And they're walking around in the shops or whatever. One of them looks over and there's a girl standing behind the counter with a blue shirt on and her name tag is Sarah. And so they're like, whoa, 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 this is like, you know, they were tripped out a little bit. And, but, uh, and I'm sure I'm getting some of the story wrong because it it's been a while, but the heart of it was there. What they essentially did was walk over and they said, are you Sarah? And she said, yeah, you know, like, yes. And they said, we were praying for you this morning and the Lord told us to tell you that your finances are going to be okay. And that's all they said. And I don't even know what happened next. But I know if that happened to me, I would want to know, okay, y'all going to be praying again tomorrow? <laughs> I got a whole checkbook here. I mean, I, I mean, that drew her into their shared life. And that's what evangelism is. It's not making, getting somebody to jump through a hoop. It's helping them drawn, to be drawn into this life with us, that we ourselves are struggling to live. And that's very much more relational and dynamic. And means it can have faces, it's an infinite variety of ways that can happen in any given day. If we're walking with Jesus and we, and we are saying we want to participate, then we're, helping, we're just drawing people into that. And, and we have to understand that the greatest evangelism ever done was Jesus. And he, you know, so he, is, he, he says, I don't do anything but I, what I see the Father do. And sometimes that means walking away. And sometimes that means saying, what do I have to do with you? I came for Israel. And mm -hmm. sometimes it means saying a word. Mm -hmm. and, but it happens within the context of real life. And, and the real life that, that, that comes to you, that, that the, the <laughs> people you cross paths with. Absolutely. And that is a part of our relationships. It's, it's like, okay, so now we've got to now come up with a, uh, small groups of relationships in order to to validate mm -hmm. the idea of relationships, right? Well, you know what? We're in them. Just look around in your life. You're, you're, they're all over. Love the people that are in your world. Allow the questions and, the, and everything to come up in the context of that. Know who you are inside of your relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and express that life. And let the Holy Spirit enter this adventure and allow you to participate with what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are trying to do in their love for the people that you love because they care about the things you care about. Mm. Very well. Amen. Put. Well, well thanks. It. Thanks again for being here. Good to be back. Good Always to see you. Always a pleasure. Very good conversation. Thanks. This has been You're Included. 
a production of Grace Communion International. Well, I, uh, I must say that uh, uh, Baxter Kruger's accent was a little difficult <laughs> to catch. For maybe for some of us, uh, it's uh, more of a, uh, what do you say, Southern, is it uh, Anil? A Southern Mississippi accent. Uh, I hope uh, you didn't miss much, uh, but he did have some very profound things to say. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes, uh, slightly a little bit more than 10 minutes for our discussion. Um, let's uh, follow the uh, agenda I had set. Uh, what, do you have anything to share about, you know, uh, that first question I asked, is the message more important than the method? What I mean to say is, yes, we, we, will ha we might have a method of evangelism, but if you don't have the right message, uh, I think that there is a problem, isn't it? Any thoughts on that? Yes, Anil, go ahead. Uh, of course, the message is important, but I think the method is equally important because as, uh, as these people were discussing, uh, if your method is to target somebody and then go after the person to evangelize and, you know, I don't think that's the right thing to do. You must have the proper method and, of course, the message. Okay. Yes, I think uh, that's absolutely right. You can have a completely wrong method <laughs> uh, and you can actually offend people. Yep. Okay. But once again, uh, the message becomes all important. What are you trying to tell people, right? Uh, any thought, any other thoughts? Praveen, go ahead. There is nothing wrong in finding some good methods, but uh, in performing those methods, uh, sorry, those methods should not make the people we have, uh, people in front of us as targets. The methods uh, should not make our evangelism artificial or uh, inorganic. Like, you know, they should be, um, our evangelism should be uh, organic out of true concern and true love. Uh, as part of our life, we should be uh, doing it. So there is nothing wrong in finding some good, if somebody is there as we are talking, uh, we all learn how to talk. And we all speaking. We are speaking about a message. We are. We are. We ought to learn how to speak a message also. And uh, since five years, I'm learning from Master Dan. <laughs> okay. So uh, method is also equal. Method is also equally important, but uh, this should not uh, make people targets. And number one, and number two thing is uh, the method should not be the primary focus. Our, if it should not take the life out of the message, you know, the method. Our in our in our evangelism, what we invest is not some technique. What we invest is our life, and uh, where we take the message of Jesus. Yes, uh, I think uh, that's well said. I mean, uh, uh, you know, if I can say it this way, uh, the method will be utterly useless if you don't have the right message, right? Maybe you'd put it another way. Bertram, you had a thought? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, in a church once, uh, uh, it was an all night prayer and uh, or some other time uh, when a lot of chairs were empty and uh, some uh, you know, were not filled and uh, a certain number of people were there. The pastor mentioned that uh, you see, we want all those uh, chairs to be filled, that is to come to church, you know, come to have a relation with the Lord, you know, uh, which God is desiring us. And uh, he says, the only thing you have to do is to love them. And God will, God will bring them, you know, and fill the, fill the church. You just have to love them and, uh, and uh, God will do the rest, so to speak. Okay. Now, now this question there was no 
mention of any methodology or uh, uh, giving them the true gospel. Uh, maybe in time, uh, when they're more receptive, maybe uh, uh, we could, uh, you know, spell out the the good news, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know. And it is the gospel God says, you know, that that changes us, that touches the heart and uh, brings about uh, transformation, brings about uh, change or you know, repentance or whatever. But basically it's love. They said you just love those people and uh, God will bring them, you know, into the church. Yes. Uh, for me, for me, even I'm, I'm, it's not easy for me, even I'm all a bit, uh, you know, confused as to, I feel that I should need an, a target, so to speak, you know, that's part of my calling, you know, not only fellowship and communion uh, in, in Christ, uh, that's what uh, God has accomplished. But now God says you have to, pa you're participating in mission also, ministry. Ministry is of Christ. We just participate with it, you know. I'm also still, <laughs> I'm also not clear about it. Okay. Thank you, Bertie. Yes, I think what you, uh, what you said and what Praveen said, learning to understand that we share life with people, right? And uh, coming back to the method message, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. We must have a method. I mean, uh, nothing wrong with the method, but uh, we have to make sure the message is correct. And uh, Doc, Dr. Baxter Kruger mentioned that one of the things we need to clarify in our mind is we are not uh, first and foremost asking people to receive Christ, but First and foremost, they need to understand that Christ has actually received them. You see, that is, should not be inverted. We need to help them understand, like we say in GCI, you belong first. Then it's because you belong, you believe. And once you believe, you start becoming, right? So you, you don't change that order. You have to help them understand you belong. Now you believe that you belong and now start living it out and becoming like Christ. So I think that is a message, that's the Trinitarian message that we need to make sure that we don't compromise on. Right? Yeah. There, is, there is another point we should keep it in our mind as we're talking about methods. Uh, sometimes what happens as we uh, share evangel uh, to talk about God and evangelize, how sometimes our methods become our message. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples. You, many of you may be aware of this technique called Roman Road, sharing the gospel with all with the, the scriptures completely taken from Book of Romans. They, they call it Roman Road. So you have to talk, all have sin fall the short of the glory of God. And then uh, there is another scripture that comes that says, uh, uh, you know, Romans 3, uh, 3.23 and then Romans 6.23. So they, this order is there. So according to that, you have to preach. And there is other method also called, uh, uh, in other method, the story method we, in which we share our story. Then we ask people to tell their story and then we'll talk about Jesus' story. So this is how we venture into, so we try to evangelize people. What have the problem with these, I mean, you can use the scripture and from book of Romans completely and you can preach, that's not a problem. But these methods have somehow, they have become and they have shaped the message. That is where we should be careful with these methods and uh, these tools. Yeah, very good. I think... Uh, uh some good thoughts there. Let's move to the second question. And it is, is evangelism accomplished through our daily lives or reserved only for professionals? <laughs> uh, uh, I think we already uh, sort of alluded to uh, an answer to that. Uh, we as disciples of Jesus, as Christians, we embody the message. We are the, uh, we are the message uh, in one sense. Uh, and so all of us are lights for Jesus. Uh, now, it is quite possible some might have a greater passion for that. They go to school, they learn how to do it and become professional evangelists. And that's fine. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that life itself is 
you know, an evangelism. Uh, the way we live our lives itself is evangelism, and we don't reserve that just for the so-called evangelists in the church. We are all evangelists. Any thoughts on that? Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, if you say that, then uh, uh, take an example of a family. Uh, okay, I've I've, I've responded to the calling and uh, received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm living a Christian life as much as I can with my, along with my weaknesses. But I'm also praying that my other family members also come to the point of, uh, you know, responding to the call and, uh, and receiving Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. You know, that salvation may come to the household. And uh, so sometimes it just... <laughs> Uh, uh, years pass by, <laughs> and uh, as you know, uh, many many times in a family, even just a person, one person, one member of the family is called to Christ, while the others are not. And uh, when you say our lives are, you know, are, as as a disciple of Christ, we uh, we uh, we embody uh, godliness and uh, the truth, and that our lives reflect Christ. That's very good. But why, uh, what about our families, you know, who have not come to Christ? Uh, is there is, is something that we lack uh, that they are not? Because in the Bible it says, households have come to Christ, like Cornelius and other. At other times, uh, you know, there are many people and families where just one member of the family is called to Christ. And all the others, like my own family, <laughs> my brother, sister, no one is called, although I've been in the church. Uh, by the way, Ms. Zachary and I were baptized <laughs> uh, long, you know, we were we are brothers, twin brothers, so to speak, <laughs> baptized, you know, in uh, way back. But uh, they still have not, uh, they've seen my life, they appreciate it sometimes, they do mention it, we appreciate and all that, but never mm -hmm. respond, is God not calling them or have they not been influenced? I sometimes wonder why they're not influenced, uh, why they're not uh, seeing uh, like, you know, along with my weaknesses, why they're not seeing Christ in me? And why, uh, okay, that is my family, friends, before I got married. And, but now, even in my family, after marriage, I'm still praying that salvation comes to the household. Okay. And I was just talking about the family, 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 uh, family, this thing. Right. Yes, Bertie. Family, uh, yeah, thing. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not an easy answer to question, I mean, it's a, to, a question to answer because uh, why somebody has not yet come to Christ is something that uh, uh, only God knows. But the fact you mentioned that you're praying for them shows that you're including them in your shared life. You are sharing your life with them in one sense because you're praying for them. Now, when they will actually respond, uh, of course, make sure that <laughs> your life uh, doesn't... Uh, you know, discourage them from saying, I don't want any of this stuff. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, uh, leave that to God. And, uh, you know, you continue to live naturally, uh, uh, you know, the life of a disciple. And of course, the Holy Spirit knows when and where to bring them into the fold. So uh, any other thoughts on that? There is something okay. called a savior syndrome. Uh, people, they feel uh, the world is before me and God has called me. So I have to save the world. And they work relentlessly without rest and all. And they'll be tired. So we all need to realize that uh, we are not the saviors of this world. Uh, but we are just messengers of the savior who bring the message of the salvation. So ultimately it is God and Christ who and the Holy Spirit who saves people. So we just work with God, but ultimately he does his work as a, Jesus says uh, in one of his parables, even after working everything, and we should say it's all you who have done. You remember the parable? So uh, we just leave it into the hands of God. Right. Yes, yeah. thank you, uh, Praveen. Let's quickly go to the third one uh, and uh, permit uh, Permit me to, you know, take another extra five minutes. Uh, uh, we normally finish on the hour, but uh, uh, let's look at the third question. And that is, I think, uh, perhaps a little bit more closer to us here at home. Should we initiate friendships with an agenda to evangelize? Uh, 
you know, uh, the reason I put that question is, uh, uh, I think in India, sometimes uh, we have made several mistakes. And, uh, uh, and of course, not that, you know, uh, we have been falsely accused, but some people unfortunately manipulate. And manipulation is not evangelism. Uh, you know, you have to learn to respect the freedom of conscience uh, of another person. Uh, and you never manipulate someone into accepting Christ because that is not a genuine, you know, conversion. Uh, conversion is completely of the Holy Spirit that brings and turns one's heart, you know. So, uh, uh, we must be careful of agendas. I think uh, uh, Bertram mentioned about empty chairs. Let's fill them. Uh, we have to be careful how we do that, you know, because uh, we can start uh, using, once again, methodologies that can become artificial, manipulative, and coercive. And that is not correct. Uh, you know, and I think we have to be careful that people matter, like was also shared in the discussion. Uh, we must not make evangelism transactional, right? Uh, it should be entirely relational where we share life, but it's not a transaction where you say, well, if I can only somehow lure this person into the, uh, into the, you know, into the fold, that's not correct. As uh, Baxter Kruger was saying, make them jump through hoops and come, you know, and join join the church, that may not be right. Any any final thoughts on that or any other comments you'd like to make before we end? I just have uh, one thing to add. And I think very, Achin, go ahead. Yeah, very rightly put forward by Anil and then Praveen and uh, and you, Uncle Zach. But there is a one downside to it. Nowadays, we have become so reserved that we said, if I do anything, it's either a methodology. So the safest thing is I will leave it out. People will come and ask me and now I'm very political with God and with everybody else. If this zone to be. So that's where we need to tell ourselves Jesus has specifically asked us to go therefore out in the world and share but with the right motive. If you love your friend you will not keep Jesus to yourself. But with the right intent we need to. We need, there's no other option. But with the right intent as rightly summarized by many of you. Otherwise, we are keeping Jesus to just to ourselves and that's <laughs> good. I think that's a very good point, uh, Sachin. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, it, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we become too, um, you know, the me and my Jesus kind of syndrome. I'm happy with my Jesus, you know, and I really don't uh, care for anybody else. And that is a very selfish, uh, you know, attitude. And I don't think uh, the Trinitarian life does not lend itself to that at all. The Trinitarian life is one of sharing. The fact we are alive is only because uh, Father, Son, Spirit share their love with us. So I think very, you very rightly said that we have to find opportunities to share. But I think what you said was very important with the right intent, not just to bring them and then dump them and have no relationship with them after that. That is the unfortunate. Um, I would like to add a couple of points to what Sachin said. Uh, that's, that's a very great observation. As Apostle Paul says, oh, to me, if I do not preach the gospel, you know, that's where we ought to be. And in, in fact, if you could get connected to the life of uh, the Trinitarian life of God, we could not uh, stop ourselves from sharing. So that overflows from us. And uh, so we can never sit back at homes and uh, we should be constantly thinking about uh, going out and we should be intentional about evangelism. Uh, that's what I guess uh, Shachin also wants to say. We, it is not just something that happens. I'm going around and uh, through, through my walk or something, it just accidentally happens. But we should be intentional. Apostle Paul was intentional throughout the book of uh, Acts. If you see, there are part, uh, and Jesus was intentional uh, in certain places where he, scripture says, he has to go 
through this road because he was intentional about those uh, our only thing we need to be realized is we should be intentional about people salvation sharing the gospel but we should not be experimental or like a method or experiment like they are some kind of a target that should not be our motive uh, that should not be our way of functioning we should be intentional about people going out to people and sharing uh, what we believe and what the message is and another one more thing is uh, we need to be realized the intention of our gospel uh, intention of our evangelism is not to align them to our belief system or in order to make them to believe what we believe but our intention should be how can i share the love of jesus it is so amazing it's a, it's, a, it's so tasty and so i would like to uh make my friend also test that like david said oh come test and see that the lord is good he is inviting people to test it so that would be a better way of uh going where we will be intentional as well as uh we work with love without manipulation okay well Just that a- completely runs us out of time uh, we'll take one last comment from berti and then uh, we'll stop go ahead berti yeah it's good uh, we are mentioning about uh, about relation relational and uh, intentional and sharing the love of christ but one thing comes quite clear to me and uh, sometimes i feel i'm short of doing it where the bible says proclaiming repentance for the forgiveness of sin i <laughs> at what point are we to tell them that or you know because we all us we have all us in fallen short of the glory of god etc but the bible clearly says that we have to proclaim the gospel definitely involves this a uh, proclaiming but we have to uh, that the partic- particular person uh, or whoever we could say mankind in general okay. applies to you, you and everyone right. proclaiming repentance for the forgiveness of sin yes uh, uh, but uh, obviously we don't have time to really unpack that but i'll only say this the way we do that is to help them understand that the lamb of god has come and has taken away the sins of the world it is not that they you know they do something for the sins to go away it is yes. for them to understand that the lamb of god has taken away the sins so it is uh, helping them to come to christ where forgiveness is already available so that yes. the repentance is that that mindset changing that mindset okay uh, i'm sorry we can't uh, comment any more uh, yes. uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for giving me some extra time today uh, i think it was well worth it and uh, uh, god bless you all this evening before we close uh, may i request sachin if you can uh, bless us with uh, a closing prayer let's pray our oh, father gracious lord indeed uh, we what a wonderful time we had and we want to thank you uh, for uh, speaking to us and helping us to understand uh, how great and how uh, mighty is your love and how um, mankind need to hear it a lot god with the right intent with the right motive right methodology lord in it we want to thank you for speaking to us uh, through the videos a lot and we continue to pray that let your holy spirit work in us uh so that we further understand and implement it in our lives in every way oh lord help us to live the life that you intend us to oh lord once again we want to thank you for this time thank you for um listening to our prayer and to the prayers that we're going to answer we thank you lord once again we bring uh, pastor zack to your throne of grace and mercy thank you for giving him another year oh lord and thank you for keeping him uh, over us we thank you oh lord we pray that you bless him are you be with him this year fill him with your wisdom with your spirit and with your joy oh lord it knows no bound so want to thank you continue to be with us lord let your holy protection be upon us and we continue to pray for our loved ones our friends who are struggling at this moment with the covid uh, impact oh lord we pray for complete recovery we pray for all the provisions uh, that they need at this point of time I want to thank you and bless you give you glory and honor in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen.
Amen. And God bless you all. Enjoy your...